um, other organizations in the industry with information and assistance. Um, we we would like supermarkets to move to environmentally friendlier refrigerants. Uh, we'd like them to reduce the amount of refrigerant that they use in their systems. Uh, we'd like them to reduce and eventually eliminate uh, refrigerant emissions. And in order to help them do that, Green Chill promotes advanced refrigeration technology strategies and practices. To achieve these goals and our mission, we have three programs. Um, our corporate emissions reductions program, that's when you hear about Green Chill partners, um, that's what we're referring to. Uh, supermarket companies sign up to become Green Chill partners. They commit to measuring their refrigerant emissions on an annual basis, and they set reduction goals um, to reduce those emissions. We have a source certification program because um, obviously the only way to achieve corporate-wide refrigerant emissions reductions is to uh, put in an awful lot of hard work store by store. Uh, so with the store certification program, we award either silver, gold, or platinum level certification awards to individual <clears throat> stores. And the third program we have is called the Advanced Refrigeration Program, and that is uh, we we develop best practice guidelines. We hold this webinar series uh, that has a lot to do with information exchange, um, et cetera. So so that in one slide in a nutshell is the is EPA's Green Chill partnership. Um, to to just set up the topic today um, specifically, uh, you know why does Green Chill promote advanced refrigeration technology? You know, um, is is this answer to uh, supermarket refrigerant emissions? And I guess the answer is no. It's not the answer, but yes, it is one answer. Uh, we consider advanced refrigeration te technology to be a very, very good solution to the problem. It's obviously not the only solution. Um, and Green Chill's job is to make sure that you all. Um, in the industry, have as many solutions as you possibly can, and that to enable you all to pick out the solution that best meets your needs. The reason we think advanced refrigeration technology is a very good solution is because um, it enables supermarkets often to substitute environmentally friendlier refrigerants um, for the more traditional refrigerants that are, are normally used in standard stores. Um, and the Probably the, the main reason is because a lot of advanced refrigeration technologies um, prevent refrigerant emissions. Whenever you can prevent emissions, it's certainly always better than repairing emissions because, you know, by definition, if you're repairing it, that means that um, a certain amount has already harmed the environment. So we certainly prefer prevention over repair. Um, having said that, a lot of advanced refrigeration technology options make it much easier to find and repair leaks when they do happen, and um, it uh, also allows for quicker identification of leaks. So to set up the situation and start off by um, kind of giving us the uh, a brief overview of the traditional um, centralized DX refrigeration systems that are um, in use and that represent the majority of the systems out there. Um, Bruce Hillmeyer from ZeroZone is going to give a brief explanation on that technology and then we're going to move on to the advanced options. So go ahead, Bruce. Thank you, Keely. Central, Central DX systems also have some other common names. They may be called a parallel system, a complex system, a loop system, or probably just something as simply as a rack. What's good with these types of systems, but it's not specifically stated, is they're generally going to use an HFC refrigerant or an old systems that are out in the field that may be an HCFC refrigerant. The combination of having a large central system using direct expansion refrigeration out on the sales floor, having a refrigerant that's an HFC or an HCFC, makes it clear they have a release of a large amount of refrigerant that can damage the atmosphere. In the slide here, it shows a typical rack. And on a rack, you take a number of compressors, mount them onto some steel support structure, and ship the, the unit complete to a store. A gross store may have it 
installed in the back room, or it may be put on a mezzanine in the back of the store, possibly set on the roof or possibly enclosed in the house and set on a concrete pad out behind it. There are six, these types of systems that, that make it more likely to have a large leak rate. In this, you wind up with having somewhere in the back room, you might have the rack located, and you have your refrigerated fixtures um, typically spread along the sides of the store and out along the walls. It takes a lot of copper tubing to get the refrigeration out to the racks and to get the refrigeration back to the rack. Um, with all that copper tubing, you have a lot of joints and a lot of connections. Each of those has the potential to possibly create a leak. The other thing you have with a large system like this is typically a lot of refrigerant in the system. Charges, refrigerant charges could be as high as 3,000 to 4,000 pounds. If you have a catastrophic leak, if a line breaks, it doesn't just have a simmering leak, there's potential to lose all of that refrigerant. Contracord so, has joined the conference. Historical leaks can typically be as high as 25% for these types of systems. Some stores could be losing 800 to 1,000 pounds of refrigerant in every year. Another trick with large system charges is it may be difficult to find leaks as they occur. So you could have a small leak, you might be losing 25, 50 pounds, but it not actually noticing anything in your system performance until that leak's gone to 100 pounds. So it's a lost opportunity in terms of getting a technician out there to, to look for a leak and correct it. Looking for a leak in a large system like that is, is no easy task. Um, with all piping out in the store, you have a lot of places to check to see if you have a leak. Then to identify the leak, you still have the challenge of getting equipment in to do the work. If you decide a display case, you have to remove product to get at it, and typically you're going to have shoppers in the way, creating some challenges to do the work as well. So you know, well, with all these challenges and the potential for leak, leak higher rates, why would anybody be buying these units? Well, some reasons people buy them, and or I say the, the primary reason is really familiarity. Out in the grocery store world for a long time, so there's a long history. Grocers know some works, they kind of know how long it takes to have it installed, how it's going to last over time, and they also know the costs. Second thing, the technology works um, in terms of keeping the product cold and safe for their customers. does a very good job of that. Technicians are familiar with it, so they don't have to learn too much, too much new equipment. And lastly, as improvements in installation and maintenance techniques have taken place over the years, it's possible to get your leak rates in a, in a system like this to under 10% and of some of the, the costs and wastes of refrigerant. Summary, the challenges of this type of system is, first, it has a very large charge. Second, that charge is spread out over the whole grocery store, giving you a higher potential for leaks and makes it harder to find and, and correct those leaks. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, next, I'm going to hand over to Travis Lumpkin. He's going to uh, address our first type of advanced refrigeration technology. So, uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Keely. Uh, um, advanced slide here. I'm going to be talking about distributed refrigeration systems. Now, these have been out for a number of years, and they differ some regards to uh, centralized systems in that you have multiple units versus uh, uh, centralized uh, any from one to three units. Uh, these units can come in various forms and packages. Uh, there's a few examples shown in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Uh, and the intent of these types of systems is to a smaller um, unit that is better matched to your loads to shoot throughout the store <coughs> And what provides you is some um, uh, redundancy, and so uh, puts the unit closer to the load, reducing your refrigerant line runs, and <clears throat> can also uh, provide some energy benefit as well. For a typical supermarket ranging anywhere from 40 to 60 thousand square feet, uh, the number of units can range uh, uh, in quantity, but we typically see anywhere from five to six units. Per store, and that would be displacing what would be traditionally used uh, with two racks. Uh, these systems can be typically in loop piping, and as a result, you have some charge reduction benefits as well. In comparison to a 
uh, besides the DX system, there are uh, benefits uh, in, in terms of charge reduction as well as leak potential reduction, which are the goals of uh, the Green Shield Partnership. <clears throat> Compared to an air-cooled system, a, a distributed system typically reduces your refrigerant charge in the neighborhood of around 40%. And again, it does depend on what type of uh, centralized system uh, you're comparing it to. If you're comparing against a loop uh, system, the charge reduction would vary. Uh, when you look at water-cooled system, uh, a water-cooled would be uh, the means of condensing the refrigerant versus a uh, traditionally used air-cooled condenser. Uh, we see charge reductions in the neighborhood of 60%. And uh, when you combine uh, a distributed type refrigeration system in a secondary format like a glycol system in action with a water cooled uh, condenser uh, you can see charge reductions up to 90 percent as compared to a traditional DX system so a lot of uh, benefit in terms of charge reduction that you can get from a distributed system and along with that if you reduce your charge and you have uh, raised joints and your equipment's located closer to your loads uh, you can reduce the number of fittings in the store and uh, reduce your leak rates as well. And, and you see there, there's some leak reductions ranging anywhere from uh, 15%, again, as compared to a centralized DX. And there's also some energy improvements that are achievable uh, depending on how the units are applied. And as a result of reducing charge and reducing your leaks, there's benefits in terms of carbon footprint that you would uh, as well. Next, let's talk about how these systems would be arranged in the store. There's multiple uh, ways that uh, end users have been uh, doing these throughout their their uh, uh, grocery stores. Some are putting them in the back rooms where the storage, uh, dry storage goods are. Um, some are putting them ab above walk-ins. Um, some have actually them outside on top of the roof uh, for outdoor equipment, and uh, there's also uh, customers who've actually put these uh, above cases uh, where the uh, format uh, was conducive for that. So there's well, various uh, different options. That sorry, can... Travis, just sure. just to maybe clarify for some people that aren't as familiar with these technologies, so, the, so in terms of, you know, you're walking through a supermarket just as a regular consumer, the channel system all the refrigeration equipment is somewhere in a back room, and then the refrigerant has to be piped to every single case that's out in the supermarket that you get your cold or, or frozen goods. The difference here is that you, know, you might actually, you won't see it, but you're standing in front of the ice cream, and right up on the roof, right above those ice cream coolers, is the uh, that freezers have their own little unit, refrigeration unit sitting up there, and the piping goes right from that on the roof, right straight down to the cases, so you're cutting down on the piping an awful lot, right? That, that's correct. You, you, you do typically see them, um, uh, if you're a uh, uh, worker, will have more access to them, but they are uh, hidden from the shoppers and oh. in back rooms of, above coolers and freezers, depending on how the store's laid out. Uh, some stores have bakeries and uh, kitchen areas uh, in different parts of the stores, and uh, it's not uncommon to have uh, units uh, above walk in uh, coolers and freezers uh, spread out throughout the store. Again, to, to the benefit that you mentioned, having the refrigeration unit closely to the loads, and, and again, it does reduce the amount of refrigerant charge uh, that you have. Uh, there have been actual customers who put these out on the floor, the sales floor. They've uh, uh, typically put dry goods shelving around the unit set to the shopper. Uh, you've not, it wouldn't be noticed. I've actually been in some stores in Canada where the unit was physically sitting out on the store floor. Uh, but uh, you, to the untrained eye, you really wouldn't know what it was. But to, the, to yeah. your point, they are typically spread out throughout okay. the the building. Lots of little systems um, directly where you need them. That is correct. That is correct. Okay, thanks. And then as far as the refrigerant technology that you can use with it, uh, we typically see 404A uh, some that have been out there with the changeover from HCFCs to HFCs. 
but with the uh, GWP refrigerants such as Pro 7A, we're seeing uh, a lot more customers look at that refrigerant uh, as a benefit on the global water potential that it has in comparison to the uh, more traditionally used HFCs. And you can also uh, use distributed type systems with glycol and CO2 um, as a liquid circuit or cascade. So there's different options either available today or, or, or forms of those that customers have uh, done some unique designs with to uh, again displace the use of HFC refrigerants in their store and, and further reduce uh, the amount of ref, uh, HFC refrigerants that they're using. Uh, for for our listeners, the, the the whole section on secondary refrigeration, glycol, CO2, and Cascade, um, they they are uh, sections that are coming up from other speakers later on. So if you don't if you don't know what that means, um, that will be explained later on in the webinar. Thank you. Uh, just to kind of give an, uh, a better idea of how these things would be laid out in terms of uh, matching to the load and getting the energy benefit from using multiple units, this diagram kind of displays that. So if look at the left-hand side, you have the low temperature section, and typically we see uh, wide island frozen cases and reach indoor cases. By uh, matching the units and the compressors to um, to the load that are uh, the refrigerating, you can uh, uh, energy benefit by having the compressors not work as hard on the loads that uh, have lower compression ratio requirement than those that uh, have a greater one. For instance, the door cases would war run at a warmer temperature than the frozen food uh, wide island case. So by having the compressors size to the uh, door loads versus sizing all the compressors to the wide island loads, you can uh, uh, some energy benefit from the um, uh, units operating the door cases um, because it runs at a much warmer suction temperature relative to the low side and you pick up some energy benefit. And then likewise on the right hand side on, on the medium temperature uh, this is just showing a, sort of a, an extreme where you have a three degree difference but if you have a lot of meat cases or other cases that are running slightly uh, colder than your produce or dairy cases, it does make good sense to put that on an uh, on a individual unit. And again, the units that are operating at the warmer suction temperature uh, would consume less energy than those that are running at the lower suction temperature. So this kind of gives you an idea about how the systems would be connected to uh, the various different loads and and to improve energy uh, operating of the unit. So in summary, on the distributed side, who uh, should be looking at these type of systems and when you would want to put these in the store? Uh, one, obviously, if you're looking to reduce your refrigerant charge as compared to a centralized system. And then, of course, if you're interested in uh, reducing the number of leaks, uh, having fewer braze joints through the store and by having a lot less piping, uh, the, the uh, potential for leak reduction is, is reduced like, uh, accordingly. And then, of course, if you're, like we just discussed, around the energy performance of the system as a whole, uh, having distributed type systems, you can realize some energy benefits depending on how these units are applied and uh, located. So there's opportunity to lower the install cost of the equipment. And then, uh, as we looked at earlier on the TUI or the carbon footprint reduction, by using a distributed type system, uh, you can bring some uh, carbon footprint reduction again in the form of the energy and the charge. So with that, Keely, I'll turn it back over, over to you. Thanks, Travis. Um, next we're going to go back to uh, Bruce Hermeyer. He is going to do the section on um, secondary loop glycol systems. Just one clarification because I am I am I'm looking through the attendee list here and I see a lot of people that um aren't uh, necessarily uh, really familiar with um, commercial refrigeration. I see some people from 
um, states and and uh, even local governments and some other people from EPA. Just for the future slides, um, when we talk about medium temperature, um, what we're talking about when you go through the store, you would be thinking of you know everything that's cold like meat and seafood and you know some of your vegetables and fruits. When we're talking about low temper temperature systems or applications, we're talking about everything that's frozen. Um, so just keep that in mind because some of these technologies are going to only be um, suitable for uh, frozen food and others are going to be suitable only for um, what's called medium temp, which is, is everything that's cold but not frozen. Okay, Bruce should have the slides. Go ahead. Thank you, Amy. And that brings us right up to um, the slide here that we're going to talk about. Second glycol systems. And a lot of times they might be called simply a secondary system. It's sort of the, some of the first secondary systems were glycol. And somewhat of a generic term, but usually it means a secondary loop system that's going to be for the medium temp. So it's going to be cooling your meats and your cheeses and that type of thing. Things that need to be cold but don't want to be frozen. Systems, in the most generic sense, are typically going to be a central compressor system, much like we saw with the first DX system. And a rack will be designed to use an HFC gas and used as what we'd call the primary refrigerant. So it'd be a primary refrigerant. Secondly, or the second part of it, and secondary loop, would be a pro typically 35% propylene glycol system that's a cooling fluid. The fluid is cooled in the back of the room, and there's some pumps that sent out. So you have a rack on one side of this hallway. At the other end of the hallway, here's the pump skid. So in the pump skid, there's some chillers. Let me see if I get a pointer tool. There's chillers back here. So the refrigeration system connected over to the chillers, and it's doing some cooling on some glycol. The glycol is being pumped through the store with pump back here. So the pumps take the glycol, pump it through the chiller. It gets nice and cold. The, the um, cold glycol goes out to the store, goes through the cases, cools the air, comes back warm comes back through the chillers, and is cool again. So you have a, a continuous cycle on that. Yeah. So that, that means that so your harmful uh, uh, refrigerant is only staying in the back room. It's not being piped at all out to the sales floor to any of the display cases. So since in the back room, it's obviously not leaking through all of your piping in your display cases. That's correct. It's really all confined in, in one spot. You may have some condensers up on the roof to, to get rid of heat outside the building. But primarily, all of your refrigerant is, is right in this room, and you can see from um, where you see the chillers over here, all down to the other end is, is the end of your compressor rack. And this is where refrigeration is, or refrigerant is, and this is where you need to look for leaks and, and do things like that. Um, so, again, this technology is um, somewhat newer to our industry. It's been around for a number of years. Really, in the terms of the engineering community, um, these types of system, systems have been used a lot. Um, large office buildings typically have uh, air conditioning in them, and that air conditioning is usually cold water air conditioning. So if you can go in the basement of an office building, you'll find something very similar to this. You'll have a, a refrigeration chiller. You'll have some heat exchangers, and you'll have some pumps, and it'll pump water around the building. So a relatively simple system and relatively common system in some areas and fields. Out of the floor, it's similar to um, a refrigeration system in that you're piping, you're piping something from the back room all the way out to the different fixtures on the sales floor. Big difference is it's not refrigerant. It's simply propylene glycol, which comes out as a liquid and goes back into the um, back into the back room as a liquid. Bruce, sorry, just to, to explain propylene glycol, it, it's basically uh, or it, it's sugar water, basically, right? Yeah, you think of it um antifreezes. In the old days, they were ethylene glycol. Some of them are propylene glycol. It's really a, a heat transfer fluid, and it's designed to not freeze. So you can cool the glycol down below 32 degrees, and won't freeze and, and break or crack anything like that. But again, it's um, glycol is used because typically it's a, a food safe 
products. So if you would have a leak or something and it's it gets or you're not you don't have any toxic fluid or chemicals in your store, it's something that can be simply um rinsed on the drain. Environmentally benign, no no global warming potential, no ozone depleting potential. That's correct. Cases, typically, they're going to be a little bit different. If you went into your grocery store and you're watching the technician take apart the case, you're going to see a little bit larger copper lines inside the cases um, as you are pump it out to the case and you're getting the same liquid coming back. You'll have a little bit different valving inside the case to control the flow. Because a lot of times you want some, some equipment needs to have more flow to be cold, other, needs, other equipment needs less flow, so valves will be set in there to adjust it. From a floor perspective, customers will just see product in the cases. They won't see any of this. It'll be beneath the, the floor case or in the back wall. And taking a little closer look at what we might find on a, on a, on a section, this is a partially insulated one. A few components, but what's um, kind of nice about the components, you don't need much for any wires coming out of them, no power going to it. So they're fairly simple, and once they're installed and, and leak checked on installation, there's really not much maintenance that needs to be done with that. The inch lines that come back from the store, it might be six or eight inch lines. They're a tank that helps separate any air that might be in the system. From there, the is pulled the pumps and pumped back out to the store, uh, pulled through the pumps and typically pumped through the exchanger, which in this case is hiding behind it a little bit. You have another vessel on there, which is an expansion tank. It will grow and shrink as it changes temperatures. So you don't want the pipe to grow and shrink. So you have a, a, a ladder in here with air inside it. So it moves up and down um, on the system to expand and contract. You have additional valves that might be on the system that help balance the flow. But again, pretty simple things back here. Not a lot of activity, not a lot of maintenance required on these. Let me just check my notes here. Um, okay, but then someone might ask, well, how come it's less likely to lose large amounts of refrigerant uh, with a glycol system? And we already touched on it a little bit. First, it's centrally located. Type of system, you have the the rack at one end of the facility or the I say the pump at one end of the facility. So you're looking for leaks down here, or you go on the wall back over here. The rest of the compressors, you're only checking for leaks there. So it's pretty fine. You may have to go out on a on a roof and look for a leak at a condenser. So you can. It's only a few places to look. You can find them. With um, it runs a piping. There's less joints, less potential for leaks, and it's a lot easier to repair it. There's not going to be someone in a grocery cart trying to run you down if you need to change a fitting, or make other adjustments, or if you possibly need. Need some to bring in some equipment. The area, um, other main component is being smaller and compact, you use a lot less refrigerant. So there, there's going to be less refrigerant stored inside there, possibly a third less than what you might see in, in a, a Centrex system. So have a catastrophic leak, a line breaks, or something like that. There's large in the system, so there's less potential to actually leak a lot of refrigerant out. And what you wind up with that is. Um, be more charge. As you start seeing a leak develop, you can get more um, to earlier um, notification that there is a leak and get a technician out there. If a customer is interested in spending some additional dollars in, in supplying leak detection equipment, a lot less cost to it. You can put your leak detection equipment particularly in this one room and instead of having to buy enough leak detection equipment to put it all across the sales floor. Uh, as Travis indicated, um, Glycol can also be applied to distributed systems, so you can have a, a smaller amount of refrigerant out in your store. And there's also modular systems, which use a lot of small chiller packages um, run in parallel, so that gets you even to a, a tinier amount of refrigerant in each specific system. Some of the enhancements um, grocery store people might see would probably be more even product temperatures. As the, the cases run and go through defrost, you get a little less spiking than you have with a deep system. So as I said, we might say, well, why isn't everybody bought glycol systems for their medium temperature applications? Well, there's some um, challenges with it. Well, there's literally hundreds of them out in the, in the United States and operating well. 
they're still new. So there's a lot of technicians that maybe haven't had exposure to it, so they're not sure what's going on. Some grocery stores may not want to try a new technology. They're not sure about their expenses, how much it might cost to install it. So sort of, it's just that, that general newness that, that, that people tend to be a little bit hesitant. Um, there's potential to have an energy penalty with a glycol system. Possibly you could get it as high as 4% or you could have it a lot less. Um, a lot of it depends on how the system is designed, how it's installed, and how it's um, help when it's running. The cause for a potential increase in energy use is first you had a two-step heat transfer. First, we're cooling the refrigerant that cools the glycol, so that's one step. Then we pump that glycol out into the store to cool the air, that's the second step. So when you have steps of refrigerant, the compressor have to work a little bit harder. Another way you can lose some energy is you have pumps running there. Pumps consume some energy, so you're using a little more energy to pump that glycol out and around the store. Again, to design and installation and operation, um, those energy losses can be minimized. In terms of costs, may be higher, but again, you'd want to get, get some bids. So it's all the manufacturers are more than happy to bid different types of systems. So if you're interested in it, you need to just, um, consult with um, equipment suppliers and ask for those prices. I'll summarize, glycol systems typically um, have very low leak rates for two reasons. Again, is that it's in a small central location, so it's easy to find leaks. And second, because it's a small system, there's basically not a lot of a lot of refrigerant in the system that can leak out when you have a leak. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, Scott Martin, and he is going to present um, a similar type of system for low temperature using dioxide. So, uh, go ahead, Scott. Thanks, Keely. So, we'll start with a, a piping schematic here of what the system looks like. In the upper, part, upper left hand corner there you'll see a traditional rack system and we're not really focused on that so much. That's just like Bruce has been talking about, Travis has been talking about. It's a traditional refrigeration system. It can be whatever refrigerant that you choose. 404A, 507A, 407A. We want to focus on the heart of the system, the lower part here, that is the CO2 portion of the system. Type systems will give you at least a silver certification and green, fill, green chill certification program. Uh, depending on what you do with your condenser and your heat reclaim. And I want to question that. You could even hire certification if you use water cooled condensers or integrated heat reclaim system. So out with that heat changer first, that is the condenser evaporator. It's an evaporator on the the FC side on the primary refrigerant side and it's a condenser on the CO two side. So on the right hand side there we have the CO two condensing into a liquid. It's a braze plate heat exchanger. So reliability in the system there. The component is the separator, and the job of this pressure vessel is to separate the vapor CO2 returning from the sales floor and let it rise to the top and recondense in the condenser again. The liquid falls to the bottom and is pumped out into the store. And with liquid pump, now this pump is much smaller the pump, the picture that Bruce just talked about on a glycol system, it's a multi-stage centrifugal pump. This is the only special component for CO2. All CO2 components are standard HE refrigerant, standard off-the-shelf components with the exception of this pump, made primarily to pump liquid CO2. Evaporators are heat exchangers that are out in the display cases or walk in coolers or freezers. And it's simple to note that, that this system can be either be low temp or medium temp. Uh, primary began use uh, in a low temperature system. It can also be used as medium temp and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
Evaporators are circuited specials as a flooded evaporator coil. They use off simple solenoid control. So when the display case needs cooling, you let open the solenoid and let the cold CO2 into the display case or into that evaporator and boils and absorbs the heat and turns it back to the machine room. Benefits using CO2 as a secondary fluid, there's a lot less pumping power to a single phase fluid like glycol. Usually the flow rate is about one tenth for C2 as a glycol system. This saves on the piping network. The piping network is much smaller than glycol and it's even smaller than traditional DX systems. Rule of thumb is the line supply and return lines are one size smaller than traditional DX. Save on average, you save at least 60%, and you can go even higher than that, depending, like I said, what you do with the condenser on the system or and the heat reclaim. There's 30 of these stores operating throughout North America. The fund in North America was in 2006. And like we talked about before, all the primary charge is confined to the machine room and the rooftop condenser if you're using an air-cooled condenser. Does can charge and makes it easy to locate any leaks. Is this all right, right there in the main room or on the air cool on the roof with the air cool condenser? Simple system, uh, no expansion valves and EPRs, no balancing valves. The system is self balancing, uh, piped and installed properly. That is. Uh, so solenoid, you open it like I said. So basically, you have a discharge air probe in the case that senses the air and opens the solenoid. So nothing simpler than that. On off control and all return issues. This can be a problem when it's very in a supermarket and even having floodback conditions. So it won't have chance to damage your compressor due to oil or liquid refrigerant gathering out in the store. Here's a typical machine room of what that looks like, the liquid vapor separator pressure vessel, the condenser evaporator is mounted above it. So, that, Keely, I'm going to give it back to you. Okay, thanks, Scott. Uh, next, we're going to go to Dustin Atkinson, and he is going to present on CO2 cascade systems. Go ahead, Dustin. Thank you very much, Keely. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the benefits of this type of system. First off, obviously, the reason we're all here is to reduce refrigerant charge and reduce our impact on the environment. This particular type of system has a pretty substantial reduction of what I'm going to call the primary refrigerant or AC potentially uh, environmentally harmful refrigerants. We found a 600 to 1800 pound reduction or potentially even more depending on a specific site setup. And then also see a significant reduction in leaks for a variety of reasons, which uh, the HFC refrigerant is typically going to be uh, restrained to a small area. And as all, it's going to have a lot less piping. So not only is there a lot less refrigerant leak, but then also with fewer joints, you're going to have uh, significantly reduced uh, potential there as well. Because two items and a variety of others, it does allow you to reduce the LCCP or life cycle climate change performance pretty substantially. Uh, so that, that just means that overall there's a lot less impact on the environment. You're typically going to see about a 50% or more uh, reduction versus standard systems, so that's definitely a notable impact. And then you're also going to have very, very comparable energy performance. It's just plus or minus a few percent either way. And it's very dependent on both the excuse me, conditions and the specific site setup. Uh, very good performance. And one very important thing to note here is that you're also going to have the opportunity for some accelerated case pull-downs after defrost. We're looking at somewhere on the range of two-thirds to three-quarters. Uh, reduction, so that's very, very good performance there. 
Uh, move on to a little bit about explanations, and first I'm going to reground um, on the traditional system. On the screen now, you see a very generic uh, outline of a traditional refrigeration system. This is the conventional system that we mentioned earlier. Uh, basically, what you're going to have here is one continuous system or loop that's running through the store, and refrigerant is just circulated and returned, circulated and returned. And then the heat is rejected outside the store. If you take a look at a cascade system, there's definitely a variation on that in that there are really, really dependent systems. Uh, each of these sides really operate almost the same way as a direct expansion system would that uh, we talked about earlier. Basically, what you're going to have here is what we refer to as a top cycle and a bottom cycle. Uh, the top cycle, that is the primary purpose of that cycle is simply to condense the CO2 that is found in the bottom cycle. Um, the CO2 that's in the bottom cycle is going to then be circulated to the store, there are the refrigerant loads, and then it's going to come back around and once again that refrigerant is going to be condensed after of the top cycle and bottom cycle. And basically, those two cycles are going to be connected through a heat exchanger, which allows that to take place. I'll touch on a few key attention items that need to be considered when you're looking at a system like this. First off is component and piping selections. Uh, you make sure that all of the components and pipes are uh, selected such that they're able to withstand the higher pressures that are found when you are operating with CO2. Secondly, you're going to want to make sure that the servicing tools and equipment are compatible. One thing I'll specifically note there is that we very strongly recommend that low loss fittings are not used on any gauges or testing equipment uh, just because you have some major damage to those pieces there because they're not designed to operate at the pressures that you would see CO2 at at uh, a high te higher temperature. It's going to be very important that the uh, installation is all non-condensables very thoroughly removed. Uh, very important for both the performance and the operation of the system. Uh, there are a few things you can do to make sure there are no condensables in the system. First, use high-grade CO2. Uh, a very pure CO2 is a pretty substantial assistance there. I'm uh, going to need to filter the refrigerant as it's being added to the system, and then need to make sure a proper evacuation is conducted prior to the uh, of the system. Um, Sorry. Yes. Sorry, this is Keely. Can you just explain a little bit more? I, I've never heard the term non-condensable before okay. or condensable. Okay. Sure. Be That's basically to. any contaminant that could be in the system. It could be any ranging from chemicals, oils to potentially shards of copper uh, from the piping process. So basically you're going to make sure you get any impurities out of the system. Okay. Okay. No problem. Mm -hmm. but then you're going to also want to make sure that you have uh, the proper leak detection and protocols in place because typically the leak detection materials that are provided or used for standard DX systems are not going to be utilized in CO2 systems. It will require different equipment and processes to a certain extent. And then, obviously, this is a relatively new technology. So one of the key things is ensuring that all technicians and service people are actively trained on this technology so that they don't find a surprise when they show up to a job site. Uh, I do want to mention, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but there is a very significant difference in operating pressures going from um, under HFC refrigerant like R404 up to a CO2 type refrigerant. Looking at a factor of anywhere ranging from about, I believe it's 7 to 13 or times, so looking at a lot of multiples, uh, going from about 17 PSIG to about 200 NEF. So you definitely have to take considerations into your piping and components there. Uh, so I want to reinforce that really quickly. And also I want to touch, of course, on safety. Uh, there are some considerations you would need to take into account here. Uh, first off, you want to have CO2 leak detectors to make sure you can detect any leaks that are in place. 
Finally, the next three are, are touching on the pressure again. You have to make sure that all of the components, the piping, and the display case coils are all designed for the working pressures that you see with CO2 because you want to make sure that there, there are plenty of strength there to contain the refrigerant. And then so you're going to want to make sure that the regulating and relief valves are used so that you can work within the pressure that the system's designed for. Basically, want to make sure that if for any reason there is ability to cool the CO2, there are methods in place to uh, address that. I believe that is uh, the entirety of my presentation. Keely? Oh, Dustin, Thank um, you. Let, me, let me ask, or, or I guess this is more a question for all of the presenters, okay. just to put into context when you say that this is a relatively new technology okay. in the United sure. States, um, yes. if I'm if I'm correct, or I obviously only know about the number of these systems from Greenshield Partners, but I, I think there were just five or six of these systems um, from Greenshield Partners in the entire United States by the end of the year 2010. Um, is that is that approximately accurate? Uh, that is representative of my knowledge, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so when we say new, we, we really mean very, very new. Right. Um, yes. And uh, you know, and, and one of the things we do all the time with Greenshill is uh, because it, um, a lot of Greenshill partners are at the forefront of some of these new technologies and pioneering them. Um, the information exchange <clears throat> on those new technologies is incredibly important um, and actually key to to them expanding even further. So. Um, we, we certainly expect to have a lot more of them in 2011 and beyond that. Yes, definitely. So, okay, so now I'm going to hand back over to Scott Martin um, for his uh, second type of technology. Go ahead, Scott. Okay, it's Keely. Yeah, and another clarification there is there are maybe not with Green Chill Partners, but there are several more. Of, you know, Getting close to 20 of those type systems installed the cascade systems. So a little bit of a clarification there in terminology explanation. I first spoke about secondary CO2 systems, and then Dustin just described the cascade, or what's also called subcritical systems, which are typically used as low temp. I'm going to talk about a combination system combines medium temp secondary and low temp cascade. And then Travis is going to speak about medium temp transcritical systems. Or, and that you can add a low temp booster or cascade to that transcritical as well. So the term can be quite confusing. And there's a lot of new terms, especially for North America. If we go back to the system that I described a few minutes ago, the secondary system where we're circulating liquid out into the store through a CO2 pump, the solenoids and the display cases. And the, so what you see there all in, in blue would be CO2. And then all the orange and, and yipping would be HFC type refrigerant with conventional rack. So that would be a, a secondary or pumped CO2 system. Have a, DX cascade system, like I just described, with the exception being that down below there you have the pull piping would be the discharge piping off of the CO2 compressors. So you've got CO2 compressors introduced to the system and the for low temperature. You have that upper cascade or top side system. But now you're introducing the electronic expansion valves to the low temperature display cases or walk in freezers. Because as of yet, there's no good mechanical thermostatic valves to rate CO2. So I looked at these systems side by side, where you have the left side being the pump system and the right side being the cascade system. You'll notice there's a, a duplicate duplication of components there, the liquid vapor separator or the receiver, and then the upper cascade or top side refrigerant system, the right there, and then the, heat, the plate heat exchangers. So what you can do is you can 
combine those systems into one system. We have one rack on the top side, one set of heat exchangers, a common liquid vapor separator, and CO2 pump. And we go to the left out of the common liquid header there, you go medium temp loads, and they're just on and off control because you're going to pump that two out in the 20, 25 degree Fahrenheit range. And then take the take, you go to the low temperature loads and expand it through an expansion valve and back to the cascade cycle. So this is a combination system, um, combination CO2 medium temp secondary and low temp cascade. And this will get you at least a gold circulation level, a tremendous reduction in refrigerant charge. And you can go to platinum. We've done uh, a couple of these systems achieve platinum certification. And again, depending, whenever you go with the just low charge of platinum, you have to be very concerned what you do with your condenser and heat claim loads on that upper cascade or top side system. That greatly affects the overall refrigerant charge because you have reduced the charge so much. So the microchannel condensers and lo strategically locating those condensers close to the top side rack is important. The benefits of this combined system is obviously the reduction in duplicate components of the, the of cascade and the heat exchangers and the pressure vessels. You also have a common liquid supply for low and medium temp. That will reduce the overall copper that's required to pipe or install the system. Then there's going to be the 60 to 90 percent reduction in the primary HFC charge versus a traditional DX system. And this is pretty easy to attain because there's no low temperature HFC refrigerant required in the, anymore except in the condenser. So all the low temp is CO2. All the the in the sales floor in the back room coolers and freezers is CO2 and the HFC charge is in the machine room and the condenser. Uh, Ten of the type some that are operational since 2009 so it is a relatively new technology but with good experience to date. Some energy saving potential here especially on the the low temperature system. The CO2 is a tremendously efficient refrigerant. You're able to increase the saturated suction temperature, compressors run a little bit warmer, and you're able to save some energy over traditional DX system. And then, uh, leading to Masood's discussion here, there's a possibility to use different refrigerants for this upper cascade system. So kind of gives you different opportunities for your upper cascade rack or that system that's condensing your CO2. Keely, I'll give it back to you. Okay, thanks very much, Scott. Um, first, uh, a, a word. Uh, we're running a little bit behind in time, and, and that's not the presenter's fault. That's actually my fault. I had some... Uh, technical difficulties with my computer and, and with the webinar um, right at the beginning. And then um, even while I was doing my my section and speaking, there were all kinds of strange technical things going on here in the background. So um, I, I, I don't want to cut down on the time that I give um, Masood or um, the, the last presenter, Travis. So um, uh, I apologize to everyone. Everybody, we will have the question and answer period. I, I'm, I'm hoping that we get a good 20 minutes or, or 15 minutes. Um, so, uh, but it, it's, it's my fault. So, um, Masu, go ahead. Thank you, Kelly, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, this uh, whole session is entirely very logically laid out, and as Scott has just mentioned. Uh, how these stores are configured with this uh, CO2 secondary and uh, direct expansion system. 
we have always talked about, uh, you have heard about the secondary systems using glycol, CO2, and we talked about conventional HFC refrigerant on the top side. Now, the ammonia-based refrigeration system is basically it is going to cater to your top cycle refrigerant requirement that is predominantly used with HFC. This system is going to be a pure indirect refrigeration system. Ammonia, as you all know, it has been used for hundreds of years, and it's an excellent refrigerant from a thermodynamic point of view. The key fits you would see is it is a very efficient refrigerant, and you can see energy efficiency gains when you compare with HFC refrigerant anywhere between 5 to 10 percent, depending on what refrigerant you are comparing to. This would uh, reduce your substantial indirect emissions like for like. Uh, you would see about 15 percent reduction in LCCP or TV. And when you compare with a conventional system, you would see about 50 to 65 percent reduction. This directly fits into the Grinch's mission of using environmentally friendly refrigerant. This refrigerant has a very high latent heat. If you compare with or for 4A, you are talking about 10 times that of uh, R4A is the latent heat of evaporation, which directly implies that your mass flow of the refrigerant in the system is going to be very less. It implies that the component sizes are significantly reduced, which leads with the green chills mission of reducing leaks. And this use of ammonia as an indirect refrigerant will add the use of high GWP HFC refrigerants entirely. That means this stove, when you use with a ammonia and a CO2, is zero that impact or emission impact. Uh, the beauty of the refrigerant is the systems can be designed with very low specific charges. I'm talking the charge of the order of 0 0.6 to 1 pound per ton of refrigeration. This, in terms of uh, initial certification program, if you look at the silver certification program, you talk about it needs about, you will meet silver certification with 21 pound for ton of refrigeration. Now, if you use the ammonia, you are reducing the charge by 35 times lower than a silver certification. You are reducing the charge by 25 times lower than the gold certification level and reducing the charge 10 times that of a platinum uh, certification level. So this gives you an immense possibility to reduce the charge, which is another green shell mission. Most systems using ammonia will not require any hazard or risk management because of very low specific charges, such as uh, EPA risk management program threshold quantity is 10,000 uh, pounds. Then, uh, EPCR, which is the Environmental Protection Community to, uh, Right to Know Act, talks about threshold quantity of 500 pounds, which translate into the system size. You're looking at 6 million BTU refrigeration load. That is not uh, the size of a typical supermarket. Uh, a disadvantage of ammonia is its low vapor density. It is one-tenth of our 404A. That means uh, the volumetric refrigerating capacity of this system would be nearly same as R404A, which translates to same size of the compressor if you refer it to the volume. Uh, another body of the ammonia is the high isentropic compression exponent, which is 1.31. When you compare with R404A, it is uh, 1.14 implies that the discharge gas temperature of ammonia is extremely high. If you are operating at a, a saturated section of 14 and condensing at 90, you would see large gas temperatures of 270. Uh, the components are designed for that kind of temperature. The advantage you get is excellent heat reclaim capability. Ammonia has a very high uh, heat transfer coefficient because of its favorable specific heat thermal conductivity, and viscosity parameters. Ammonia are easily detected. You don't need a leak detector. It is alarming. When you use concentration of 5 to uh, 50 mm, you sense it. You will know that it is leaking. 
And ammonia is definitely toxic and flammable. It is uh, categorized as A3 group refrigerant, and you would require st special safety and design considerations. Uh, the industry is used to it, and there has been proven technology to take care of those things. Uh, advantage of uh, ammonia with oil is it is most of the oils that are currently available are not miscible. That means the oil will separate out from the refrigerant. In a way, it is easier to match the oil, and it improves the safety features. On the other hand, it will give you some special situations in the system for oil recovery uh, from other parts of the system. That could be the evaporators. The limited material compatibility, it cannot be used with copper. So you would see all the systems with steel or aluminum alloys. It does increase the durability of the system. That means uh, the uh, joints won't break easily because you're going to weld it. Uh, but, but since it has a lower thermal conductivity, you will see a slight dis, uh, disadvantage when you uh, evaluate the heat exchangers. Picture of the uh, system that you would typically put the ammonia, as Malik, Scott, Travis, uh, and Bruce has mentioned about the systems. On the left side is uh, the top cycle, which would be using ammonia. On the other side, it is what uh, has described with the CO2 can be used for pump circulation. And Dustin has mentioned about CO2 with the direct expansion cascade. And last slide, uh, safety mitigation, uh, leak mitigation measures. Now, there are abundant regulations, codes, and standards that prescribe the design methods we need to follow for using ammonia. And ammonia is given very special considerations to that. So if we follow those regulations, codes, and standards and implement the design features, it will uh, make the system relatively safe. And as it goes with any system design, always build layers of defense against various scenarios. Those layers of defense can be in terms of inherent, which would be basic process control. The layer of defense is passive, which we do it mostly in the CO2 systems, that monitoring and creating alarm for critical parameters. And the third is the uh, inherent features that you would use, which would be the leaf devices that would uh, discharge high pressures and collect the refrigerant at one place. You would, add, uh, you would like to eliminate the common sources of leaks that would happen in a system, especially the ammonia. You want to use the stop valves and control valves with the seal caps to prevent the leaks. You would to use the connections to be all welded instead of flanges. That would eliminate the uh, sources of le le leaks. And always use the certified welders. Use uh, part non-district examination techniques and C pipe for minimizing the leaks. And although fringes are unavoidable in certain serviceable components, you would need it, but try to minimize it. And minimize the atmospheric release of the ammonia. Most of the codes will always dictate you to install some um, emergency pressure control systems, and you would like to connect all the to a single point for treatment before you release the refrigerant to the atmosphere. And when you are designing it, uh, select uh, the equipments very carefully and eliminate or minimize the high-risk equipment, such as uh, consider using plate exchangers. As Scott has mentioned, it is a highly reliable device versus then tube. Lay down the failure rates of the components that you are going to use it and minimize the use of uh, Components that possess high risk, such as, for example, the gauges, a very high failure rate. Visible hoses, they have a very high failure rate. Take it out, minimize it, uh, and uh, the order of ascending of uh, leak potential goes from flexible hoses to valves to heat exchanger, and very less in piping and pressure vessels. Provide adequate features for leak detection, failure detection, and prevention so that you can shut down some of the systems where you realize the leak. The systems would have a, such a low amount of charge 
as when you heard Bruce mentioned that typical canal reference system in a store would hold three to four thousand pounds of refrigerant. And when you go into a indirect system such as glycol or CO2, even when you use the platinum level certification, the charge of the refrigerant goes into hundreds. It could be 200, 300 pounds. But when you use the ammonia, that reduces to multiples of 10. You're talking about 40 pounds, 50 pounds, 80 pounds. So there's significant potential for reduction of the charge. You completely natural refrigerant. You the shell for minimizing the leaks, and this is guaranteed to give you platinum certification. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masood. So for the last section, I'm going to uh, transfer over to Davis Lumpkin. Thank you, Keely. Talking about a refrigerant system that's more than used in or are seen today in Europe and uh, some in Australian markets. Uh, we've, to my knowledge, we've not seen these type of systems uh, yet in the U.S. This is really on the verge of uh, new uh, refrigeration technology uh, as it becomes available in the United States, but something that's been around for some time, and that is uh, transcritical CO2. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a minute. But what I've heard from Bruce and, and Scott and Dustin and Sue around the CO2 secondaries and ammonia systems, we've all heard where there's primary uh, system which removes the heat from the secondary system, be it glycol or CO2. Uh, an HFC refrigerant or ammonia is used to... to uh, remove the heat from the refrigerant uh, or liquid that's uh, circulating through the displaces and walk-in units to remove the heat and, and maintain the <clears throat> of the of the foods. With transcritical CO2, uh, high side equipment is no longer necessary. It's not used. CO2 is the only refrigerant uh, uh, being used at all. It's compressed and it's also circulated uh, through the store. So there's no other refrigerant except uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, so a little bit about what it is. It is an entirely carbon dioxide or CO2 system. There's no HFCs, no uh, ammonias, no other types of uh, uh, used in conjunction with this uh, system. It does operate at a higher pressure than what is normally seen with the uh, 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 more typical refrigeration systems. Uh, Justin had, Dustin had given some comparisons on the side for for a that range anywhere from 17 to 6 to 7 pounds, depending on what uh, temperature you're trying to operate in your cases. But on the high side, uh, where you're condensing that HFC refrigerant uh, through like an air-cooled condenser, you'll see operating pressures with 4 for a somewhere around 300 pounds. Well, with C2, uh, you'll see uh, a magnitude of pressure of around 1,600 pounds, 1,600 pounds, up on the uh, out, out of the discharge of the compressor. So that's a, a big difference in where transcritical CO2 and, and refrigerant systems uh, are in the operating pressure of the system. Uh, the transcritical systems are known to operate in two modes. It depends on what kind of temperature uh, you're condensing at, or if you actually do condense. One is a transcritical mode, and again, I'll show you what that looks like on a, on a curve in a, just a moment, but that's temperatures above 85 degrees ambient. And subcritical mode, which would be below 70 degree ambient. Uh, uh, but Scott and Dustin talked about the subcritical operation of CO2, and again, that's uh, lower pressures and in secondary or cascader arrangement. And a benefit you see from this type of a system is there's no HFCs. You don't have to worry about the impact of the carbon dioxide on the environment if it's leaked. Um, uh, though these systems can leak just like any other system. And now you have multiple conditions and things of that nature. But the impact on the environment is uh, negligible. Now, the picture that I'm showing on the right bottom right-hand side is a two-stage transcritical system, 
Um, I'll explain a little bit about the efficiency of a transcritical system as compared to other systems in just a minute. But the reason why I'm showing you this type of a system is in uh, able to make a transcritical system more energy efficient. And by using a two-stage system where we have, have a stage low-temp compressors for the low-temp side and the high-side uh, compressors for the medium-temp side. And you're all using CO2 here, and there's no other refrigerant being circulated. Uh, other thing with, with CO2 on the transcritical side is we actually don't condense the CO2 in a denser like you normally would see in a, in a regular traditional type system where you have like an air-cooled condenser on the roof where we uh, turn the discharge vapor uh, into a liquid and then circulate that liquid throughout the display cases in the store. Here, when it's in a transcritical operation, uh, we just cool the gas. Uh, it's still a gas when it goes in and it's still a gas when it comes out, but we've removed some of the excess heat and, and uh, reduced temperature some before we circulated that through the store. So I talked a little bit about uh, the difference between subcritical. I mentioned the word subcritical and transcritical um, earlier. And here's the two cycles uh, on a pressure enthalpy uh, curve, which is normally re used in reviewing how these systems operate. On the left is a subcritical cycle. And again, it's what we've uh, heard. This is just around CO2 used as a secondary refrigerant and to used as a cascade in a cascade arrangement. We basically operate the refrigerant below the critical point, which is indicated by the uh, letters CP at the top of that curve. That means that we're below this critical point of the refrigerant, and we can actually condense the, the refrigerant gas into a liquid and use it in, uh, in a manner that's more traditionally uh, seen in a uh, vapor compression cycle in a supermarket. The right hand side is a trans critical operation of the system. Again, we're above the critical point for carbon dioxide. So in that transcritical mode, we actually condense the gas uh, by means of using the ambient air. We actually just cool the gas and, and lower the temperature before we uh, feed to an expansion device that's out in the case into pressure. So from a very high level Level viewpoint. That's the the big differences uh, in, uh, between the two systems. And accordingly, uh, the higher you are uh, above that critical point, uh, the pressure will be. And that's why we we see pressure around 1,600 pounds. And as you go below that critical point, uh, you see more uh, pressures around the 400 or 300 uh, pound range that you see on the subcritical systems that are used in supermarkets today. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of how these systems compare to uh, more traditional systems that are used in the supermarkets or even some of the advanced refrigeration systems. Uh, we're not going to get too much into how a transcritical system works so much as uh, uh, how it operates. Um, here's a comparison of a 404A direct expansion system and a C2 secondary or liquid research pump system. Uh, with a, a transcritical system. And you have the various different curves. You have the, the purple-looking curve representing 404A, the blue curve representing a secondary CO2 system, and then the red curve representing the cascade, or the transcritical system. And they're operating around 20 degrees evaporator temperature and around between feet and 120 degrees uh, condensing or uh, gas cooling. And uh, not to get too caught up in the in the axes, but the axes are, are there, and, and the uh, ratios have been done to provide a non-dimensional number uh, in order to do an adequate comparison, um, so we can get relative performance of these systems to each other uh, without having to look at uh, uh, specific conditions. So, looking at this slide, uh, you get to the uh, more traditional temperatures where uh, you're condensing you know, above 100 degrees, you'll see that the the red line uh, is significantly low, below the the 
purple and the blue lines, and actually starts happening around the 60 to 70 degree mark. You see where the performance starts dropping uh, considerably. So this is where the system starts operating in a, in a transcritical mode. Uh, you see that uh, vertical line. That uh, has the subcritical to the left and transcritical to the right. That's where the uh, CO2 system starts working above that uh, critical point that we looked at earlier in that dome. So, out in that range, we find that the system is less efficient than the other systems in terms of about 60% relative to a medium temp system. And again, medium temp would be your fresh foods, your ease daily. Things of that nature of food products that are not frozen. Okay. Same. So yes. I, I'm, I'm, I hate to do this, but we really are running incredibly short on time. So I just wanted to um, let you know that we're at 3:24. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Otherwise, on a low temp system, we see similar results that the transcritical mode and the higher pressure mode, the system is less efficient than the uh, other systems, such as a cascade or CO2 or 404A direct expansion system. But when you are down in the uh, subcritical range uh, and the uh, low condensing temperatures of 50 to 70 degrees, you can get some comparable uh, performance. Uh, this just shows the impact from a... Um, uh, warming uh, potential in terms of refrigerant leak and energy consumption, and warmer impact or in a warmer climate, as, uh, or I'm saying a colder climate such as Sweden and Denmark. You see how the transcritical system over to the right uh, compares to the other systems uh, in terms of energy and uh, leak potential or the, uh, uh, direct impact on the environment from leaking the refrigerant. It's hard to see that there's a little bit of red at the top of that transcritical system as well. And in a, in a warmer climate, such as North America, uh, we've done a relative comparison there. Uh, there's about a 30% higher energy use, again, in the transcritical mode uh, as compared to other systems. But you kind of see here that a transcritical system would have a similar impact as a distributed system would in a much warmer climate. So the question was asked, how can uh, CO2 transcritical systems be used in other regions of the world and, and uh, uh, an efficiency that's acceptable? And in most cases, it's when the system is operating in a lower pressure or subcritical state for the majority of the year versus uh, in the transcritical uh, uh, region of the refrigerant. And in those cases, you can uh, realize some energy uh, improvement uh, is the energy consumption that the system has in a transcritical mode. So that's that's it. Keely, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Travis. Thanks to all our speakers. Um, and I, I apologize again that we don't have um, a lot of time here for questions. It, it, it's my fault. Um, but we do have a couple minutes, so if anybody has some questions, go ahead and raise your hand, and um, I'd be happy to take a couple. I don't. I can't believe there are no questions. Uh, Mike, Mike McFadden, go ahead. Okay, this question is for Scott Martin on the. Uh, I guess it would have been both. Uh, two systems, the, the pumped and the expansion or the combination. Uh, so you mentioned that the line sizes rule of thumb was one size smaller than DX. But becoming a liquid pump system with a two-stage return, would those sizes be comparable to liquid and sun lines? Or would it be more like a glycol system where your supply and return are the same size and they'd be one size smaller than, say, a uh, 404 quid line? Be like a liquid and suction line, and typically, Mike, it's one size smaller than a DHFC 404A liquid suction. I mean, you're right; it is a supply and return if it's a pump system, but the supply line is usually smaller than the return. Three phase return. Right. The only question I had on the combination system: there was a liquid suction heat exchanger. Uh, 
the liquid came off the bottom, uh, mm-hmm. pumped one of the liquid vapor separator, it went through a heat exchanger, which was boiling off any liquid coming back on the suction of the CO2 for the low temp. Exactly. The relative temperatures there. That protect the compressors primarily. It's a, a superheat, superheat to the suction gas. Uh, compressor manufacturers use both Bitzer and Copeland make trans, uh, subcritical compressors and want good superheat going back to the compressor. So we're protecting the return gas or warming the return gas going into the compressor with that reduction heat exchanger. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mike, for the question. I think we have time for one or two more. And else? And all of the presenters said was 100% clear to everybody. All right. Well, if nobody has any questions, then I guess I don't have to feel very guilty about uh, the presentations go into the half-hour question and answer period because we evidently um, need a half-hour question and answer period. Um, well, again, I apologize for the poor time management. Um, thank you very much to our speakers. Um, I, I, I think that uh, the people who... Um, aren't very familiar with the industry. Um, I I know that uh, some of this was incredibly complex, um, but you know, it is a refri- commercial refrigeration engineering is a is a pretty complex world. Um, and um, I appreciate that all of our speakers made themselves available. We're willing to share their knowledge with all of us. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, I encourage you actually to post them on the LinkedIn group where we can all have a conversation. Um, everyone can weigh in. Um, alternatively, you know, feel free to to send questions my way or any of the speakers' way. Um, this will be posted on Green Chill's website in the archives. So if you think that someone else would enjoy. Um, listening to this and they weren't able to attend the webinar, um, feel free to, to send them the link once up. And um, thank you very much and look for our invitation for the next webinar for July. Uh, we're, we're always very, very happy to take suggestions on webinar topics, so feel free to send those to me too. Well, thanks everybody for taking the time to attend. I appreciate it and, um, and have a good rest of the afternoon. Bye-bye. Connected. The conference will be terminated in two.